Now it's time for Alexander Schlepfer of Aster Capital. Welcome back to EcoSummit. He's a recently recovered ski jumper. Hi. <laughs> Involuntary. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to be back here in one piece after about uh, four months of, uh, of staring at my ceiling at home. I'm glad to be on stage again. Um, so, quickly about Aster Capital. I think many of you know us already. Um, you know, we are a venture capital fund. However, we have uh, three corporate investors with whom we work very closely as part of their open innovation strategies. And, uh, and so we do bring additional to capital. We do bring access to, to those large groups uh, in terms of, you know, potential joint development uh, cooperation um, with, uh, with the large groups. However, we are a financial investor, so not a strategic or corporate investor. We would invest uh, between one and four million euro in an investment round uh, over several rounds. We take a board seat normally with our investment. And currently we are more focusing on later stage opportunities because our fund uh, from which we are investing is a 2010 fund. So we're in the fifth year, uh, final year of the investment period. Next year we're going to launch uh, the next fund and then we can do early stage stuff again. This morning, Alexander spoke. Uh, Alexander Frankenberg from uh, from Hightech Gründerfonds spoke about the, you know his experience in the clean tech investing, and actually quite by I mean certainly by coincidence, um, I think many of the points I'm I'm putting here on this slide are are quite identical. Um, so essentially, we're looking, you know, uh, VCs today are looking for capital efficient uh, lean startups looking for fast track development, short time to market, looking for disruption dis uh, to, to existing markets, um, look for end-to-end -end products or services, uh, what Tesla uh, nicely showed this morning. Um, we're looking for scalable uh, recurring revenues, and obviously we're always looking for a charismatic CEO. Um, now, I'd like to Dil drill a little deeper on two points, on the lean startup concept and on uh, disrupting um, innovation. Those are buzzwords and we all know the theory um, about the lean startup, for example. Um, you know, essentially put out very quickly, very early, the minimum viable product, put it in front of your customers and then systematically collect feedback and, and reprocess that feedback, reposition your product, maybe completely what's called pivoting, completely change your you know, customer base, your focus, or strengthen and pursue and invest more if you see it's going well. So that's the, you know, the lean startup model theory. And in practice, we, we see that in Silicon Valley, we have many good examples of how such lean startups have, um, have hit the market and have been quite successful. I've taken here four examples. You see that those are mostly consumer goods, so essentially B2C business models. August is the, um, is the smart key lock. Canary is the motion sensor, so essentially detecting if someone is in your house and giving you information about house. Misfit is sort of a fit band, uh, an activity band, and Pebble, of course, we know already. Um, Interesting is, I mean, these B2C startup companies, um, they started off with an idea of a, you know, a small team. Um, they quickly got crowdfunding, and obviously if you're able to crowdfund, you have also your first launch customer base. You know, those people who fund you, they want to obviously your product, and you get very quickly that, um, that feedback uh, on which you can then create the buzz and finally attract the venture funding. So that is the sort of the lean startup model as, as shown in the Silicon Valley. Now, the question is, you know, can we do that in capital goods? Can we do that with investment goods? Um, I'm, it's obviously not the lean startup concept. You cannot translate one to one. It's more difficult to get crowdfunding for, uh, you know, for large capital goods that you sell to utilities. Um, but there, there, I think there are some learnings that are really interesting um, and some, um, you know, levers that we can pull. So, um, one that is extremely important in my view is that we build our businesses, our business plan on sound assumptions. 
and, and we don't fool ourselves. We still see a lot of, of um, you know, standard um, uh, commonplaces uh, when we talk to entrepreneurs. You know, they say, they tell us, well, green, everybody wants to go green, and so they, they will pay for a green product. But just how much is, is a customer willing to pay for a green product? You know, do we, do we really have an answer to that question? Do, is it just a CO2 price of whatever, five, six euros per ton, or is it more? Um, energy efficiency is paying for itself is also a commonplace. But you know, energy prices, are they really increasing? I mean, look at the oil price. Look at uh, the electricity price in the wholesale markets. Are energy prices really ever increasing? Can we just extrapolate, you know, 5% per year increase? I'm not so sure of that. We might actually have to deal with decreasing fossil energy prices for quite some time. Uh, thinking of, you know, peak demand and so on. Um, the three-year payback, you know, what is, if your product pays back in three years, is it really, you know, just the device? Or is it the installed device? Or is it also you know, operating an installed device. I mean, what, what, on what basis do you calculate your payback period? Another element that is extremely important is that we don't try to hit the market, you know, the minimal viable product uh, idea. Don't try to hit the market with the fully fledged and developed product, but try to maximize, you know, use available platforms, use available technologies first, take them to market in a whatever, in an alpha product, and then when you see that the market is really interested in that product, then go for, the, for your own development. Um, winning prepaid orders, I think that's really important in, in, an, in, in an industry that's uh, struggling to find the capital. Um, so get your launch customers to finance your, your, your proof of concept and your proof of value. Um, the recurring revenue business models, also interesting in hardware, however, obviously, you know, the Haas hardware as a service business model is only financeable if, um, if uh, you have a sh very short payback term or a product that's, you know, a couple of hundred or less than a thousand uh, dollars or euros worth, uh, worth of, of uh, investment. And then the other one, the pivot, really, if you see that after a year or two, still customers are not interested in, in your solution change. I think even after, after a year, you should, th uh, sh you should think about changing uh, business model, changing maybe customer base and so on. In, in our portfolio, we have the company E2Gas. And if you look at that pi picture, is that the minimal viable product? You know, it's probably the maximum viable product. <laughs> but we heated quite a lot of those uh, lean um, startup um, ideas in it. So essentially, we got you know, the, this was the first plant um, that E2Gas built, so a power-to-gas conversion plant, 6 megawatt. The technologies were all available technologies. So we did not, you know, build our own electrolyzer. We did not build our own methanation reactor. We took, essentially, what was existing in the market. That gave the customer, which was Audi AG, the comfort to place a large contract to a startup company, a 20 million euro contract to a startup company, and, um, and, and pay for it. So we had essentially our launch product was paid by the customer. We got him pay for that. So the, the prepaid order. Um, also, the, you know, the, the basing on sound assumptions, um, E2Gas's business model is really for every plan to do a detailed feasibility study together with the customer. So it's essentially a large upfront consulting uh, type of work, but that gives us the, the advantage to, first of all, really understand the economics of the customer, and second, have a very good visibility, you know, when and what are, uh, are the next projects going to, uh, to come, the next tenders, and so on. And finally, pivoting, we had to do some pivoting, you know, the, the original business model was really focusing on going to methane, all the way to methane, and inject the methane, and we see increasingly you know, that hydrogen is essentially, so the first step, hydrogen generation is, is, um, is uh, more, uh, is easier and more economical. And so we are focusing also on the hydrogen route. Um, maybe a final point on disruptive innovations. Um, you, you probably know uh, Clayton Christensen's um, theory about, you know, disruptive innovations um, where 
you have two paths. Um, one is the, um, you know, the, the real disruptive innovation, and the other one is more sort of the incremental innovation. So this is the, um, you know, try to get into a market with a better product, a higher performing product, getting into an established market. What is interesting is, you know, that customers may not always have that high expectations. The average customer has actually, you know, a fairly fairly stable expectations of what this product should serve. And if you innovate beyond the customer's performance expectations, you risk getting into a, a niche where, uh, where you have the nerds and the geeks uh, only interested in your product, while the mainstream is still going essentially uh, with the incumbents. So Christensen then said that essentially the better strategy is to push for a lower cost and, you know, obviously a product with less features initially, but once you scale up, uh, once you get into that market and, you know, have surfed the bottom end, you go um, to the, uh, you, you, you move up essentially in terms of performance and beat your competition. And that's what a lot of, you know, disruptions have been about. This exactly, Tesla is obviously is, is more in that, or probably the third, uh, approach, the third uh, idea, which is really about, and that's the Kano model that I've integrated into this, you know, delight your customer. Offer something completely new to your customer that, that makes him really happy. You know, that touch screen there in the, in the Tesla, for example. So the better user interface is, a, is an important uh, aspect. Or the end-to-end -end service, so that you really, as a customer, the Uber experience, where you get the, the full the full experience of the taxi service is not just an app, um, or the unique features that stick, you know, the swipe or the magnify on the iPhone. So those are, you know, essentially approaches, and obviously, again, we as venture capitalists, we like to see this or this. Here it's extremely tricky, and we still see too many startups that try to push the performance, better performance, and push themselves into a niche. That's it from my side. Um, just our you know, some of our recent investments, by coincidence, one is here today. Hugues de Bontel uh, <laughs> from Cosmo is going to present next. Thanks. Well done. For those of you who don't know, if you become a sponsor, silver sponsor in your case, you have actually the right to present one portfolio company. Yes. That is how it works. <laughs> and they always choose one of the best. Of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, now it's time for Thanks. your portfolio, okay? Thanks, yeah. Fine. Yeah.